Okay, here we are, chapter fifteen. Um, we talk about we talk about ethics in um, quite a few classes. It's I always tell people the story that um, when I was in uh, college and also in graduate school, um, there was never any talk of ethics, and it really wasn't until uh, after uh, two thousand when there was sort of so many corporate scandals, Enron and Tyco, and locally Adelphia and all these different places that. Um, that marketing, I'm sorry, that marketing ethics really became a big issue. And um, now we talk about it, and not, not just marketing ethics, but business ethics in general. And um, now it's a, it's a very important part of, of every um, business curriculum, which I think is really important. So the first thing we talk about is um, societal marketing concept, which again, you know, we talk about marketing one. And it's this idea that you want to satisfy the needs and wants of the target markets, that, but also to preserve and enhance the well-being of consumers and society as a whole. Um, but you also need to fulfill the profit objective. So it's you know, fulfilling the needs of, uh, of um, your immediate the people in your immediate environment and also the community at large, that we have that um, organizations have a responsibility to also take care of um, of the community, not just the, the people within their own, um, within their own area, with you know within their own within their own um, in, internal environments. Okay, so we talk about um, uh, consumer socialization, and um, you know there's a lot of uh, targetable segments that can be easily exploited um, because they're more vulnerable than most other consumers because usually less education, old age, low income, little political power, and um, so we talk about different forms of exploitive marketing, um, exploitive marketing. So there's talk about in terms of um, consumer socialization, this idea of um, consumer socialization is the process by which young people acquire skills, knowledge, and attitudes relevant to their functioning as consumer in the marketplace, as a consumer in the marketplace. So um, Essentially, you know, there, there's been quite a bit of research on consumer socialization. There's essentially three stages. One is the perceptual stage, during which children begin to distinguish ads from programs, and they associate brand names with product categories and understand the basic script of consumption, the basic idea of consumption. On the analytical stage, when you're 7 to 11 years old, during which children um, capture the uh, persuasive intent of ads, and they begin to process um, cues regarding products and develop purchase influence and negotiation strategies. Then the reflective stage, which is 11 to 16, when children understand advertising tactics and appeals, they might become skeptical about ads, they understand complex shopping script, shopping dialogues, and they also become capable of influencing purchases. So and we talked about this when we talked about um, you know, the influence of family, uh, when we were talking about reference groups, um, influence of family, we talked a little bit about this, about this um, at that time. So, you know, children, you know, they're absorbing things and, and they become aware of brands and, you know, particularly when you get to, you know, those teenage years, it's so important. So marketing to children is certainly um, something that people uh, are really concerned about because it is a group that could be exploited. Um, you know, kids tend to imitate behavior and they're not, they're not necessarily old enough to process it and evaluate the information that they see. And so um, they, there is a the guidelines that have been set up, um, uh, and you know constantly being under review. That um, particular concerns with advertising food to children, um, it, well, food in terms of obesity and, and you know safety products, that kind of thing. So here we go. The concern over link with obesity, um, uh, and um, you know, this is just one example. And, you know, certainly the Obama, Obama administration was very interested in um, making sure, you know, promoting physical activity and making sure children were, you know, they changed, they're trying to change diets in school and um, that kind of thing. All right. Um, okay. So the, that last slide was really about this idea of, you know, legislation and, and um, trying to regulate what it is that, you know, not making sure that marketers can't take advantage of, of children. So marketers understand how to persuade consumers. And um, there are some of these are a couple examples of how uh, marketers might encourage consumers to spend or more than they want to. Um, this idea of, you know, cold grocery store, um, you know, people, uh, you know, tend to buy more. 
um, moving displays, you know, so they, they change where things are. So it encourages people to wander around. Um, uh, online shoppers who've been drinking, you know, uh, you know, there's all sorts of things they know about you when you're working online. So um, designing foods that encourage overeating, like making, you know, getting people you know, addicted to food and then granting easy credit to people who might not necessarily um, should uh, not might necessarily you know have the ability to pay it back. So again, these are some more examples coming up. Um, packaging that's used to increase um, uh, consumption, uh, you know short glasses or, or wide glasses, um, people tend to drink more. Um, clear candy jars, this idea that um, tend to be eaten a lot more quicker than those presented in opaque jars. You know, we can go on and on and on. So, um, uh, um, bundling of, of products um, and, uh, you know, offering things in, um, not, you know, offering things in, in, in bundles, you know, if you, you, can, you can get, you know, the um, chocolate and marshmallows and graham crackers all together, that kind of thing. They're just tricks that people use. So the nutritional labeling has certainly um, uh, been under fire certainly recently, and um, they have, they have um, spent a lot of legislation trying to change nutritional information um, uh, in terms of making sure it's more accurate to what actually people actually buy, actually eat, people are actually eating. Okay, pharmaceutical advertising certainly is very important, very something that we talk about a lot. Um, uh, and certainly we recognize that direct-to-consumer advertising has become much, may have become perhaps too aggressive since it was legalized in 1997. Um, the, the pharmaceutical industry has developed some voluntary restrictions regarding the marketing method. Um, Senate Majority Leader has called for a two-year moratorium on advertising new drugs to consumers. And one major pharmaceutical company has volunteered not to advertise new drugs to consumers during their first year on the market, leaving it up to the physicians to, to recommend it or medical professionals. So online search engines um, tend, tend to complicate direct selling of medications to consumers. And the FDA has en encouraged pharmaceutical companies to include risk information about drugs and advertisements. Um, so, you know, there's... Uh, um, these are all things that um, you want to that people are very concerned about because it can, in fact, have a very negative influence on on consumers and and you know without with not direct information. So there are definitely advantages and advantages to um, marketing pharmaceuticals directly to consumers, and um, and you know it's something that uh, you know really should be left in the hands of healthcare professionals. It's important for consumers to be aware, but also consult someone. Okay, so there are. Um, a variety of tactics that marketers can use to change consumers' perceptions. Uh, it's often done through pricing products and product through pricing of products and product lines. Uh, consumers tend to base pricing on a reference point that's been placed in their mind, and marketers can move the reference price up and down. And consumers will often pay more for products. So there's um, we talk about JND, the just noticeable difference. We talked about that before. Um, covert marketing, or, you know, stealth marketing, often um, uses uh, people from similar demographics to, or you know, posers, people of similar demographics to market to people within their own um, uh, age range. Um, uh, liquor companies sometimes have sent people to bars, and phone companies have uh, have couples masked as tourists asking people to use their phone to take a picture. So this idea that you know you're sort of surreptitiously gaining information. So. <clears throat> That's the idea of um, paid advertisements, and um, and also when things are featured in a in a, in a television show, the product placement, advertorials are found in print media, um, and infomercials are commonly found on television and often look like documentaries. So these are some sort of like, um, you know, as I said, surreptitious ways that that the um, that people get in to the minds of consumers. And considered, you know, it's a question will be ethical. So it's also false and misleading advertising. Um, uh, puffery, you know, um, can't talk about, you know, you can't, um, you know, puff, puffing up a, a 
a product's what's known about a product truth and advertising laws. It's very important that nothing people are not misleading. Um, there are FTC guidelines on deceptive and deceptive advertising. Um, corrective advertising is required if there's if something has been misleading, and um, lots and lots of um, violations in drug marketing, omitting risk information, um, that kind of thing. All these things are, are things that you know we try to watch, and and, legis and um, consumer groups are very interested in. Okay, so you can look at this is a chart again from the book. Um, some examples of some deceptive claims. You can look at you know Dan and yogurt. Uh, um, you know, claims a health benefit, but in fact, you know, there's a lot of sugar in these things. Um, uh, you know, Nestle, same thing with health benefits for certain things, but again, are um, are not necessarily as healthy as they say. You can go through and read those and be aware. Okay. There's also the idea of provocative um, marketing, which is not necessarily um, uh, also considered to be, you know, um, uh, dangerous. It's, um, it's use of objectionable themes in advertising. Um, although marketers continuously sponsor ads portraying values or behaviors that some or many consumers find distasteful or wrong, um, the importance of public scrutiny really can never be underestimated. So you can, um, uh, again, you can you can look at you can read through that. Again, that, that's a chart from the book. Okay, so there's also privacy issues that are very important. Um, uh, lot, consumers' loss of privacy is increasingly problematic. Pro problematic ethical issue is uh, marketers identify and reach out to increasingly smaller audiences through innovative media and more sophisticated tracking. And the collection of dissemination of the information raises a lot of privacy issues. And various governmental bodies have proposed measures to ensure consumers' privacy. You know, um, now you know in terms of selling browsing history and all that kind of thing. So. Some of them consider, you know, using Wi-Fi signals to from smartphones to track consumers in stores. Um, uh, E-scores or, you know, it's the idea of um, term, determining people's buying power. Um, this idea of uh, um, uh, Federal Trade Commission, and also the Federal Trade Commission has recommended a do not track mechanism that's similar to the do not call registry, that people can put that on their phones. Um, uh, regulation of data brokers, people who sell information, um, opt-in for monitoring in monitoring. You'll see that as well. Uh, it's, it's something that you know. It's a, if you don't want to be monitored, you can opt out, or if you want to be monitored, opt in. And there's this idea of the um, the uh, turquoise triangle of having um, you know that you can click on to have people uh, not follow to have marketers not be able to to track you and follow you. Okay, so um, there are a lot of many not-for-profit organizations, um, including consumer advocacy groups, exist primarily to promote socially beneficial behavior, such as contributing to charity or using energy responsibly, and reducing such negative behaviors as abusing drugs, discriminating on the basis of race or sexual orientation, and driving while texting or drunk. And many companies try to increase their credibility by being quote, good corporate citizens and integrating socially desirable practices into their operations. So um, this idea of advocating beneficial contact. It's also the idea, the idea of cause-related marketing, that um, firms contribute a portion of the revenues they receive from selling certain products to causes that are um, socially desirable and supported by the American public. You know, and for example, um, uh, um, you know, you'll often see this, you know, breast cancer Awareness, they'll con you know they contribute a certain amount of your purchase. Um, also, you know, this Hertz ad um, talks about um, uh, you know promoting um, uh, help for um, veterans. Okay, and then consumer ethical awareness, again, you know, it's important that people stay apprised themselves of what's going on. And again, this is a, um, uh, a, a chart that's from the book. Um, and a study focused on measuring consumers' views and perceptions of companies that tackle issues such as exploitation of the third, wor of the third world, animal testing, damage to the environment, um, 
and recycling it, and it um, came up with this list of, uh, um, of a scale, essentially, that we see here, you know, personal positives, social positives, personal negatives, social negatives, and then money issues in terms of how people evaluate these things. Okay, and then um, consumer ethics continuing here. A lot of stores started charging restocking fees and limiting return policies and tracking abnormal patterns of uh, because some buyers who bought them used them and then returned them for a refund. And some stores encountered shoplifters who tried to return things um, as, you know, tried to return stolen merchandise. And then also the other thing too is, you know, software pri piracy is a big issue. So anyway, these are a variety of different ethical concerns that come up, you know, practical concerns that come up and things that people, particularly if you are interested in going into marketing, um, that you're going to want to consider. And then, but, you know, and also all of you will be our consumers and will continue to be consumers in things that you should be aware of um, when you're participating in the purchasing process. Okay, that's uh, chapter 15.